let's continue. You guys are mic'd up? Yeah, perfect. Hello. Um, let's continue because you have numerous um, opportunities to chat later on the boats. So we want to keep it going. We want to continue automating the boring stuff. We just learned a lot about planting seeds and automating away dumb decisions. And we want to continue to provide inspiration to you. And this time with our friends from Casavo. I think you didn't have a lot of trouble convincing your management on building exactly what you're going to show today. I think that's a very yeah, logical for a business like yours. But I leave the rest to the three of you. And welcome on stage. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And uh, we wanted to, to talk with you about how we had to automate a lot of boring stuff in Casavo, especially on the machine learning side. And uh, we had this problem because uh, there is a reason if there are all the Pokemons on the slide, because we had so many data projects that we needed a category big enough, big enough as Pokemon to uh, give a name to all of them uh, with, a, with a common team. And one of the problems is that uh, when you set up a machine learning project uh, or even worse, a microservice, you add uh, all this boring stuff that you need to do, the environment setup, the data versioning, and uh, in one month, for example, I need a model, Flavio needs a model, Alberto needs two, generally. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we had to decide uh, and find a way to standardize our approach, because if we don't, best case, we copy what we did last time and we don't think about it. Worst case, we reinvent the wheel every time and we won't improve any, any further with our, uh, with our uh, patterns and with our processes with uh, machine learning. So uh, it's a bit technical, we will try to be not too much uh, technical. So for example, the first thing that you need to do is that you have to set up your environment so your environment is reproducible and you can pin down exactly libraries, dependencies, and everything you need to, to run your project. So for that we use, uh, and uh, we will talk about the tools we use and what are the problems that we had with those tools because it's not, uh, it's not all good. So, uh, for example, with the, pen, with the environment, environment uh, management, we use Poetry, which is the best tools we found to uh, pin down Python libraries compared to Conda and Pip, with both have problems. And we also use it because it allows you to easily uh, pack up your projects, uh, uh, publish the packages, and uh, so we can use it in other projects, projects because maybe we need a common library for our machine learning models. And uh, the problems that we had with poetry, even if it's the best tool for uh, locking down your environment, is that sometimes it's slow. And uh, for some specific libraries, you have still have problems because they themselves do not specify their dependencies. So you need to be a bit careful with some of those. But now we have uh, our environment, and uh, we move to a more uh, substantial part. We need to version data and to ensure our experiments are reproducible and uh, we, don't, we don't commit stuff that is uh, half commit, half, uh, the code is not aligned with the data, for example. For that we found that uh, DVC, Data Version Control, is a very interesting uh, library that uh, allows us to version data the same day we version code. And you also allows us to build uh, uh, training pipelines with uh, dependencies. So you basically you build a DAG of your training with data configuration and code dependencies. So you can only execute steps that, that have changed, and you can also uh, exploit it to check that everything is in line. So the stuff I committed, the code is the same as the data, and it is the same as the results. Bonus points, you can use any remote storage you want at the provider, so S3 or GCP or Azure. So it's also easy to move stuff around different machines and different users, so if you don't have problems with remote trainings, for example. Problems we had with DVC is uh, it has some uh, performance issues when you have a lot of small files. So you need to find a way around it and uh, you build a bigger archives with all the data within them. So you lose a bit out on uh, incremental versioning because you can't version the single data and you only version, version the big blob. But uh, mm -hmm. you, you, still, you gain a lot in time and in, uh, in speed. So it still works for us at the moment. 
And then you have the problem of uh, hardware training and, and uh, on hardware for the training and uh, writing as little code as possible. So for example, the classic example is a, a deep learning project. You don't focus only on the model, you also need to write a lot of stuff uh, because it's boilerplate that uh, the, your framework needs. So for example, back propagation is always the same, the optimizer is always the same, the data loading probably is always the same as well. And so we found that uh, having this framework on top of PyTorch, which is called uh, Lightning, uh, allows us to focus more on what is interesting in our model, so what the model does, how the loss is computed, <coughs> computed and skip the stuff that is always the same, with the good part that uh, if, we if we need to override some of the standard stuff, we still have the options because you have a lot of callbacks to do that. And uh, you can uh, still set up uh, regular stuff like checkpoints, early stopping, uh, maybe some more technical stuff such as uh, automatic learning rate finder. And uh, another extremely important thing for us is that uh, it uh, allows you to easily swap around different uh, hardware architectures so you can uh, build a model on your laptop without a GPU and then uh, start uh, an EC2 instance which has, has or, or a GPU or a TPU and you just need a command line flag to, sw to switch between the two. And even using distributed training, which we don't do that much, but uh, we tried a couple of times and uh, worked perfectly. <coughs> we didn't have any problems with the Lightning, that it's uh, an early <coughs> stage project and uh, they deprecate stuff uh, really quick, so we sometimes we have to keep, uh, keep up with them with, uh, changing stuff in our project, but it's, uh, we are really happy with it. So I leave it for, uh, to Alberto for the next tool. Thanks, Paolo. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about configuration. So whenever you run into machine learning projects, you have to configure a lot of stuff, right? And most of the times you pass, I don't know, command line arguments, your scripts, or you have custom Python configuration files, you have YAML file that you have to load to parse every time. So I'd like to talk to you, uh, to you about Hydra, which is a tool that is used for elegantly configuring uh, complex applications. We use Hydra in Kazavo for this purpose. So whenever we need to configure something, we adopt this tool, which is a Python library. You just basically implement a decorator and it automatically accounts for loading uh, all the configuration that we have defined for you. Um, it's, it is not just about that. Hydra comes with a lot of other handy features such as the possibility to combine several different configurations. So assume you have like two different databases, a PostgreSQL and a SQL one, and need to like fast go between these two different configurations. With Hydra, you can just specify a single flag and we'd automatically fetch uh, the right configuration for you on the fly. So it's really handy for, for these purposes. Uh, another interesting aspect, uh, aspect of Hydra is that whenever you run, uh, let's say a training, an, exper an experiment, uh, you produce artifacts, right? You produce plots, metrics, whatever, and you always have to, I don't know, come up with some heuristics or logic to define where these outputs are gonna be saved within your um, file system. Hydra automatically creates a, custom, a new directory when you run a new experiment and sets the current working directory to that specific directory. So you can just basically say, save this file, this artifact, and automatically the, the artifact is gonna be saved in the right place. Another interesting feature that we use Hydra for is the possibility to run sweeps. So whenever you train your model, uh, you might want to optimize the model. So I mean like hyperparameter fine tuning, right? And so to tune those betas, those alphas, to increase performances that little bit. And um, so Hydra supports custom backends such as Optuna, that is a backend that we use to actually configure these sweeps and uh, run sweeps to actually perform, as I said, uh, hyperparameter fine tuning. So it's it's a really handy uh, tool. Check it out. Um, next up, we have uh, MLflow. So we talked about training with Paolo, PyTorch Lightning, um, etc. Of course, in Kazabo, we need a way to track our trainings. So MLflow is an open source solution that basically allows us to track uh, all the trainings that we do with a uh, with a dashboard, basically, and then uh, uh, it, it even performs acts as a model registry, actually. Actually, so. Um, in these dashboards, we can see, of course, all the plots going down, uh, different artifacts that get produced, and at the same time, we exploit uh, the power of MLflow to uh, store the trained models. So it's like a model registry for us. It has a really handy API written in Python that you can exploit to fetch the uh, model version that has already been trained and uh, like use it whenever you, you need it. 
In terms of uh, drawbacks, really not that much uh, problems. Uh, of course, other paid solutions such as weight and biases come with a little bit extra flavor. So you have like integrated reapers that works out of the box uh, just fine. But of course, there are paid solutions, whereas Emberflow is open source. And um, now that you have your model, you want to put it in production, right? And most of the times you find yourself in writing uh, custom endpoints, like, I don't know, you use fast API, uh, you have to define uh, your uh, Swagger schema you have. To, if you want to produce a microservice, you have to define your Docker file, uh, copy all the assets, the artifacts, whatever. And it's really a lot of boilerplate stuff that can be automated. Bin2ML is a tool that does exactly this stuff. So it automatically detects all the dependencies in your project. It uh, basically combines all the dependency uh, within a Docker image, uh, creates for us all the documentation for our endpoints so that we can just focus on uh, uh, defining how the endpoints will work and how we will, uh, let's say, interrogate our model. And Bento will automatically uh, craft for you a Docker image that you can then deploy on your, for instance, Kubernetes cluster as we do in Kazabo. So it's, it's really handy. Um, problems, of course, there are some problems. Uh, this whole deployment stuff in machine learning is not really mature yet. Uh, uh, Bento ML is a great tool, but not very well documented. Uh, version 1.0 is not out yet, so we're using some kind of pre-release, and at times it, it is broken in the past. So that, that is something that was worth noticing. So I'll leave the word to Flavio now, that is going to be discussing CML. Thank you, Claudio. So I'm going to present you the next tool, which is CML, which stands for Continuous Machine Learning. And uh, it's uh, a tool designed and created by the Tivus AI team, which is the same team we developed the Tivus C presented by Paolo. And as I just said, that is a tool for cloud training. The idea is that you don't always want to train your model on your own machine, maybe because the computational burden is too high, maybe because you require GPUs. And moreover, you want to integrate your training inside your uh, continuous deployment pipeline. Uh, so there are various ways to interact with instances in the cloud. I don't know, you can use an SSH connection, or maybe you, I don't know, figure out how to configure a, an orchestrator to organize the training. Uh, but it's not so, so easy to integrate all this stuff uh, inside a continuous deployment pipeline. So here comes CML, which is simply an action, really well integrated, uh, both with GitLab and GitHub Actions, which uh, we, use, we use GitHub Actions, for example, uh, in, in Kazabo. And the idea is that uh, you can directly create, create a, an EC2 instance, an instance in the cloud, with the required characteristics, uh, just uh, using a Git push or a Git, uh, a Git uh, so, uh, to do that, CML just needs the three main ingredients. Uh, the first one is uh, your repository token to have access to the code. Then uh, you need to pass it your uh, cloud secrets because clearly you need the permissions to create the instances on the cloud. And then clearly you need some line of configurations to specify the characteristic of the machine you want. You can specify, for example, in AWS the region, the kind of machine, security groups, and so on. Uh, CML involves also a couple of more advantages. Uh, first of all, he, when, when uh, you terminate your own pipeline, it automatically stops and terminates the, the, instance, uh, the instance you created, so you don't have the risk to waste your money for getting uh, the instance running. Uh, it also gives you the possibility to use exposed instances, which are less expensive uh, with respect to regular run, and uh, it is also integrated not only with AWS, but also with uh, GCP. Uh, we also have some little drawbacks with uh, CML, mostly related to a bit of lack of documentation uh, and uh, with the configuration of our internal VPN uh, with respect to, to CML. Oh. Okay. But uh, now let's try to understand a bit better how we use uh, uh, CML in, uh, in our training pipeline. So, I'm going to explain you the main steps we have uh, in a training pipeline uh, that we run uh, in GitHub. Uh, so we have five main steps. The, the, two first, the first two steps uh, run directly on the, on the machine provided by GitHub. And uh, first of all, uh, we dockerize our training image. So we create a Docker image containing all the environment we need for the training. Uh, and then we push this, this image to our, to our registry, which is also made on US, uh, which is uh, ECI. In the second step, we call the CML action that uh, usually in less than a minute uh, is able to create your EC2 instance with the required characteristics. 
Then the other steps run not on the GitHub machine, but run directly on the new EC2 machine created by CNL, and it restarts our training pipeline. Clearly, we exploit the, the Docker image created, uh, we just created in the first step, and then uh, we can use DVC uh, to pull our data on our, on our machine feed. This process is really quick because uh, clearly as uh, everything is in the cloud, the latency is really low, so we can download gigas of data, gigas of images, for example, in really, uh, really, really quickly. And finally, the real training starts. Uh, what I want to underline is that clearly the real training exploits uh, the plethora of tools my colleague just explained. So hyperparameter are tuned, are tuned with uh, Hydra, uh, logs, artifact model, and so on, are logged on MLflow. So uh, this is our complete training pipeline. Okay, uh, now uh, let's suppose we have our model trained and let's go to the deployment. So also in this case, uh, we use uh, GitHub Action. Here we have three main steps. Clearly we don't need CML because here we don't need GPUs. So we can run directly on the GitHub machine. Uh, the idea here is that we use Bento ML, the tool proposed by Alberto, uh, which is responsible to uh, prepare your API and authorize it, and uh, usually uh, it directly downloads the best model from, uh, from our MSO server. Then we take this image and uh, we put it, uh, we, we push it, sorry, in, in our registry, and finally uh, we deploy everything on, on Kubernetes. So I just gave you a, a small spoiler about the slide. So how do we handle the, the model in production? Uh, we usually, uh, for a microservice or for API, uh, we usually use uh, Kubernetes paired with Docker. Uh, this gives us many advantages. First of all, Kubernetes uh, uh, provides us an uh, elastic load balancer with horizontal scaling using, using the pods. Also, vertical, uh, vertical scaling if needed. And moreover, we have many fancy tools which help us to uh, end the logging and monitoring of our models, such as Lambda. Mm -hmm. So, to conclude, let me take some final consideration about advantages and drawbacks of our approach. Uh, every tool we just presented you uh, is, I want to say, is modular. So, for example, we had some problem with BentML. We are thinking about substituting it, and we can do it pretty easily. So, we don't rely on a big stack such as SageMaker or, for example, uh, Databricks. Uh, all the proposed tools are open source. You clearly have the costs coming from the cloud, but uh, every tool is completely open source. We are uh, being quite success successful in reusing this, uh, this, ML, uh, this MLOps stack in every new deep learning project we are, uh, machine learning and deep learning projects we are starting. And last but not least, uh, we have the fact that these tools uh, integrate well with our, uh, with our technologies, but uh, more generally can integrate really well with different cloud providers such as uh, AWS, Azure, and, and GCP, and with many different uh, machine learning libraries. We use PyTorch, but we also they integrate really well also with Keras and Flow Sex Learning. Drawbacks, well, clearly, as we just said, every, every tool has uh, its own problem. Uh, we have been able to manage them. And uh, configuring uh, everything has been quite challenging. Uh, it's been quite long journey, but quite a long journey, sorry. <laughs> but uh, we are really proud of it. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you for having us. And feel free to ask questions. <laughs> I have a question. Um, would we, I'd be super interested in on the output of the pipeline. So what kind of models, like what kind of use cases are you serving to, to the tooling that you have shown? And maybe if you could part of this as well, how did you like go about like identifying those where do these ideas come from for like like you said a new deep learning project, for example? Uh, everything started from our needs, so uh, every time we develop a new project, maybe we have a new challenge, we say, how can we compare the models, uh, how can we share the results with the whole team. Uh, so for example, in this case, MLflow is a really good solution because uh, all the team can have, uh, can have access to the results, uh, can directly download the models. So everything has been de de developed following our, uh, following our needs. Uh, the use cases in Casago are many. We have uh, algorithms, for example, to room detection. Uh, we work in, uh, in real estate, so we have uh, properties, houses, and, and so on. 
uh, room recognition, uh, the room uh, condition estimation, uh, facade condition detection, and stuff like that. So we have many, many images, so clearly we need deep learning models, uh, and every, everything started from that. Clearly, for example, we can use the, the root stack without using CML if, if, we, if uh, you don't need GPUs, but many other tools such as, for, for example, Bento can be reused to stack your API. So maybe you don't need every tool we just presented, but you can choose between them. Yeah, let's say that, for example, the uh, valuation model, the AVM, of course, is, of course, it's not a neural network, so you don't have the, the lightning part. And in general, it's the first project that we did, so it has only a part of the, of the stack, so it has a version control and whatever. But for example, we don't use Bento, and uh, this is one of the problems that we had with Bento, because it's really good for simple APIs, but for the AVM that is a lot bigger and has a lot more business logic, we decided to go with a full API framework because it was just uh, uh, too hard to do it in Bento. It was not, uh, there, were, there was no advantage in doing it like that. So in general, the, the models that we have are mostly the AVMs, and then uh, uh, computer vision models either to pre-process images so, for example, Alberto worked on uh, models to auto-detect uh, objects uh, in photos customers sent to us. So we can recommend, for example, how much uh, the, the window surface is in a... Windows doors, uh, we need these things to automate uh, a lot of human work. So before we had somebody look at every image and understanding whether or not sellers, people that use our services actually uploaded the images that we needed, and in case this was not the case. The, this person had to contact the, the people, ask to send other photos. Now with this stack, it's easier. Um, I just want to add a little uh, context. For example, you asked why did we decide to come up with this stack? So for instance, talking about CML, um, I don't know how many of you uh, trained uh, models or um, at least uh, tried. When you work with deep learning, okay, maybe you define your model topology with PyTorch, Lightning, whatever, and you maybe you use a Mac or ThinkPad or I don't know, maybe you have your custom rig, but you don't want to use your resources right to train a model. You might want to use the ones that your company provides you with. And so before this stack, we used to, uh, let's say, uh, detach a VPS and like an EC2 instance, log in SSH, prepare the context. Maybe we use Docker, that's okay, a good thing, best practices, but yet slow. Uh, upload the artifacts, run the script, then something break because of environment variables, a lot of stuff. And that is a lot of time that we can use to focus on model development or other work, actually. So CML take away a lot of uh, work from and our process. Also, in, uh, one of the problems that we had is that since it was time consuming to set up uh, those instances, we only had like two or three that were ready to use. And now we can just, just do two commits and two instances are spawned in a minute. So we really removed uh, completely the, the problem of setting up instances to do, to do experiments. Well, thank you a lot. Uh, is there a software where the ML team uh, more or less collaborates, uh, like a workspace or, or in any of the software that you use? Do you, do you kind of hang out in the same software mm -hmm. any, any time? We have the community of practice, so we share time together once a week. Uh, we chat each other every day if needed. We work in different teams, so we are treated in different types generally. I work on the broker side, he works on pricing, Alberto works on seller side. But we have many, many moments we share together. So for example, also I dedicated more time in CML, Alberto dedicated more time in Bento. So every time we also, we also have a morning every week we can use for training. So. What about in the software themselves? Because we are a distributed team, so we have to find like places where we would gather together, where we share files. Uh, like you mean because we work together on the same stack? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, we have like applications or microservices subdivided mostly for tribes. So, for instance, in sellers, we have this room classification model, and just people from sellers work on it. But uh, whenever we need to make a huge change or discuss, I don't know, let's use ResNet or VGG, we do that in the, in the community of practice. So we always ask for feedback, but then we actually work um, on, on our project in, inside our tribe. 
also, also in general, in those cases, I'm the problem because they are they have their context, and I'm in the pricing, pricing team, so I need to put the hands everywhere. So I need to work both with him, uh, with uh, on both the class, the um, home evaluation system, because of course he provides that to external users. I need to provide that to internal users. So that one is the biggest uh, point of conflict, uh, let's say, in ownership. But we decide that that project specific will be a shared uh, ownership because uh, there is no other solution unless we split it into different models, which doesn't make sense at the moment, even for a business stand standpoint, because we want to provide the users externally with the, the same model that we use for uh, transparency. And maybe I need to work with, uh, with Flavio because uh, he needs to work on facade uh, condition and I need to work on internal rooms condition because we can't trust the users to give us the right condition of their. Uh, of their property. And not trusting users is one of the Yeah, yeah. No, not, not trusting users is the first rule. By the way, <laughs> we open a lot of pull requests, so even cross drive. We use a lot of pull requests and best practices in GitOps in general. And yes, so. Yeah, that's probably it. I explained it really quickly before, but uh, everything is done using Git Adaption, so we push, uh, but it's for every project in Kazava, not, uh, not only for data projects. Uh, so we, have, we run tests, then we need the steps we need in the. In the CI, in the business integration, and everything yeah. is done in, in this way in order, to, in order to have everything checked every time. For example, we use commit messages to specific commit messages to start a train without uh, starting messages. Then you, then, then you have Flavio saying, No, this is not my instance, I kill it. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, maybe just one more question because if, if somebody has any, otherwise, we'll move on. 